of course, the Florence University of the Arts and the Stony Brook University. So as two major authors of our Western canon, both born and brought up in North Africa, respectively Egypt and Algeria, Giuseppe Ungaretti and Albert Camus represent a fascinating focus of interest within the Mediterranean studies framework. Among the most highly published and widely studied writers of the 20th century, the two of them undoubtedly belong to that literary tradition of spiritual, universal values, values and great aesthetic force described by Harold Bloom in the Western Canon, The Books and School of the Ages of 1994, and yet appear into the list of authors compiled in the appendices of the text under the less temporal category of the Chaotic Age. Although the Mediterranean identity of both writers has been largely examined and recognized as central in the, inter in the international critic, the two writers have never been really compared before, at least not so directly. In fact, although they were both well-rounded intellectuals, Ungaretti's principal domain remains poetry. Alongside his significant activity as a foreign correspondent, essayist, and teacher. In addition to this, he consistently translated poetry. Shakespeare, Racine, Gongora, Mallarmé, Blake, among the most important. And the, um, the translation in the Meridiani Mondadori was published in 2010, edited by Carlo Ossola. On the other hand, Camus' fame is above all related to prose, best known for novels such as L'Etranger, The Stranger, La Peste, The Plague, the so-called philosopher of the absurd, whether Camus actually preferred the definition of poet philosopher, was also a prolific narrator, playwright, philosophical essayist, and committed journalist. Moreover, Giuseppe Ungaretti was born in 1888, 15 years earlier than Camus, long enough for there to be a one, if not two, literary generation gap. His birthplace, Alexandria in Egypt, was, since its illustrious foundation, the cosmopolitan Eastern Mediterranean metropole at the crossroads of East-West political and cultural interests. Whereas Albert Camus, Camus was born in 1913 in Mondovi and grew up in Algiers, the ancient Phoenician seaport of the present Maghreb, capital of a country, Algeria, which at the time was much more specifically related to the French colonial imprint. Nonetheless, many similar biographical and thematic elements occur. In the first place, there is in common the treatment of European family roots. Ungaretti's parents, having migrated from, Lucca, from the Lucca countryside, to Egypt in the 1860s when the father and the uncle were hired to work as laborers in the construction of the Suez Canal. Camus' great-grandfather, being one of the first French settlers established in Algeria after the conquest of 1830, the so-called Pied Noir, and the grandmother of Camus being Spanish too. This fact, I mean the treatment of European origins, was somehow threatened strengthened by the loss of their fathers in early childhood. Antonio Ungaretti died in a work accident when his son was three, and Lucien Camus was killed during the first battle of the Marne in 1914, um, in which he fought in the Zouave French regiment. Thereafter, French culture exerted an enor enormous influence on the intellectual background of both authors. Just to give a few details, after attending the Ecole Suisse Jaco in Alexandria, in uh, 1912, Giuseppe Ungaretti enrolled at the Sorbonne. In Paris, he was acquainted with exponents of the lively season of the avant-garde, such as Apollinaire, Picasso, Modigliani, Braque, Gide, Riviere, but also the Italian Papini, Soffici, and Palazzeschi, and established fruitful friendships above all the one with Jean Paulin. Camus was already a well-established well -established personality in the Algerian communist cultural ambience when he moved to France during the Second World War 
where he played an active intellectual role in the Paris resistance as head editor of the clandestine daily Combat and in the subsequent reconstruction together with Jean-Paul Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, René Char, and so on. Furthermore, see points in common, the sense of belonging, the love, and the nostalgia for their North, for their North African homelands pervade their entire work, giving birth to a real myth of the deracine, the uprooted. In the case of Ungaretti, this proceeds from the issue of personal identity of the poem I Fiumi, in Ungaretti's first collection, The Buried Port, Il Porto Sepolto. The poem I Fiumi, where the poet lists the river of his life in the attempt to recollect a sort of mosaic of his existence, and leads to the nomadic utopian search for a paese innocente, the innocent country unfamiliar with the atrocity of war, until the great last poetic phase of La Terra Promessa, the Promised Land, an evident reference to the biblical Exodus, but also an allusion to the Enias's journey to Italy. Camus' deep attachment to Algeria and to its colors and perfumes, almost a carnal affection largely portrayed from the early writings of more intense lyricism to the evocative, unfinished autobiographical novel, Le Premier Homme, connects with the raison d'etre of his literary mission. Thou, though acquiring a political tinge, as the author declares in the Nobel Prize banquet speech of 1957, I will read it in English so you'll understand better. I have never been able to renounce the light the pleasure of being and the freedom in which I grew up. But although this nostalgia explains many of my errors and my thoughts, it, is doubtless, it has doubtless helped me toward a better understanding of my craft. It is helping me still to support unquestioningly all those silent men who sustain the life made for them in the world only through memory of the return of brief and free happiness. Finally, the landscape, and in particular the luminous, luminous and maritime Mediterranean one, from its bare desertic-like region, regions to the most flourishing and fragrant ones, plays a key role in the creative process of both writers. Camus, in his Pensée de Midi, Noonday Thought, matured within the context of the Ecole d'Alger, the School of Algiers, and the periodical Rivage, Shores, conceives the entire Mediterranean area as a place of nemesis and measure. A thought, I quote, a, a thought inspired by the play of the sun and the sea, as he wrote in the presentation of the review, which we can say farsightedly, the review was banned by the Vichy regime in 1940 after only two numbers. The, so the Mediterranean is a concrete geographical basis from which spreads a renewed collectivist pan-Mediterranean classicism, a humanistic outburst against all totalitarianism. I quote, historical absolutism, in spite of its triumphs, has never ceased to come up against an invincible demand of human nature, the secret of which is kept by the Mediterranean, where intelligence is sister to the harsh light. As for what concerns Ungaretti and the role of landscape, the desert and the sea of Alexandria are the originating metrics of his poetry. Sono nato al limite del deserto e il miraggio è il primo stimolo della poesia, è lo stimolo d'origine. The desert indeed is a proper figurazione della genesi creativa, a depiction of the imaginative creativity as Antonio Saccone observes in the important Sestante series monography uh, of Ungaretti, published by Salerno Editrice in two uh, 2012. In addition, the legendary Preptolomaic port of the city, which Ungaretti learns about from the brothers Twill, is the place where the poet, through an Orphic descent, 
finds the purest and most essential poetic truth. To quote from the famous eponymous poem of the collection, the Barrier Port, Il Porto Sepolto, vi arriva il poeta e poi torna alla luce con i suoi canti e li disperde. Di questa poesia mi resta quel nulla di inesauribile segreto. This rhythmic procedure of the poem illustrates what Carlo Ostola in his fine commentary calls, and I quote, the translation of the linguistic referent into a sort of metric absolute of the syllabic articulation of the verse. A translation of the linguistic referent into a sort of metric absolute of the syllabic articulation of the verse, end of quote, so that every syllable emanates almost from nowhere its unintel unintelligible poetic force. At this point, it is interesting to assume a semiology of landscape perspective, namely the approach employed by the Italian geographer Eugenio Turri in his landscape architecture studies, such as Il paesaggio come teatro, dal territorio vissuto al territorio rappresentato, or Il paesaggio e il silenzio. In particular, the metaphor of landscape as a theater, a scenery for actors and spectators where culture and nature interplay, allows us to highlight some of the functions that the Mediterranean territory has in the work of Ungaretti and Camus. To begin with, the experience of the desert as a nothingness, the very smooth place theorized by Deleuze and Guattari, engenders in both authors a metaphysical struggle as through the contemplation of the barren limestone plateau region of the Karst in northeastern Italy, where Ungaretti fought as a volunteer, or the site of the arid countryside of Gemila, of one of Camus' lyrical meditations, Nos, Nuptials. But paradoxically, even the beauteous views from Fiesole and Boboli evokes in Camus the same feeling of the absurd, as he wrote after his journey to Europe in 1936, and here I couldn't find the translation, so I read it in French. La leçon illustrée par ces hommes, l'Italie la prodigue aussi par ses paysages. Plongée dans la beauté, l'intelligence fait son repas du néant. Dans ces évangiles de pierre, de ciel et d'eau, il est dit que rien ne ressuscite offre le spectacle de la beauté où meurent quand même les hommes. Florence, un de ceux lieux d'Europe où j'ai compris qu'au cœur de ma révolte dormait un consentement. So I'll, I'll try maybe to translate. Italy is the place where the intelligence surrounded by beauty in, in certain ways sharpens the idea of nothingness. And Florence is one of the only places in Europe where I understood that at the heart of, uh, of my rebellion against human mortality, there was a silent agreement of the entire by uh, other men. And likewise, the pleasant Roman countryside inspires many poems of the sentimento del tempo, the feeling of the time which is one of Ungaretti's most obscure collections. Nevertheless, this tragic sense of perishing is tightly linked in both authors to a great overflowing sensualism. I quote from the famous poet, a poem by Ungaretti, Tramonto, Il carnato del cielo sveglia oasi al nomade d'amore. The flesh of the sky rouses oasis in the nomad of love. In this text, the overexploited Parnassian and decadent trope of a humanized nature, charged with erotic power, acquires totally new dimensions. Similarly, in the third scene, Act Three of Camus Caligola, the hallucinatory tale of the intercourse with the moon that the mad emperor pretend to have had in a stereo night is actually a lucid poetic tribute 
to the concept of human limit that Camus was elaborating at the time. Caligula's obsessed quest for the absolute brings him to what the critic have called a superior form of, su of suicide. Cette nuit est lourde comme la, comme la douleur humaine, the emperor states at the end of the play. The erotic theme allows us to address, to address another significant aspect. In fact, in both authors, the paradigm of love as a feeling of a lack, a passion in absentia, typical of the Western tradition, as demonstrated by Denis de Rougemont in L'Amour et l'Occident, is rejected in favor of a fully embraced physical joy. We especially think of Ungaretti's poem Fase d'Oriente, Fase, Atrito, and of the defense of the figure of Don Giovanni that Camus achieves in his essay Le Myth de Sisyphe, the myth of Sisyphus. This common concept of carnal love is free from any sense of guilt, the Christian mortification of sexual pleasure, or transgression, as in the libertine philosophy or in the sad, the sad. If in Ungaretti this attitude is directly attributed, as himself declares in various autobiographical texts, to the Islamic religion and the Quranic precepts on erotic matter, on erotic matter for Camus is above all the influence of Nietzsche giving birth to the we à la vie recognized by Jean Grenier as a central concept of Camus' philosophy. It is worth remarking that a very similar reference to On the Genealogy of Morality by Nietzsche occurs in Camus' Nos a Tipaza and in Ungaretti pro prose Ecco Lucca calda crudele. Thus, it is very stimulating to discuss under a post-colonial studies perspective the negotiation of meanings involved in this topic. That is to say, between the Eurocentric Orientalist discourse, to quote Said, and the different substratum cultures, with an investigation of the different exegesis of the Quran. Detailed arguments will appear in the proceedings of the conference. In this way, also by referring to the concept of location and in between by the Indian critic Gayatri Spivak, it may well be possible to identify in Ungaretti and Camus a model of pluralism and integration and to confirm the definition elaborated by the French et ethnoanthropologist Christian Bromberge of the Mediterranean as a system of complementary differences. Thank you very much. <laughs>from Mediterranean by Montale, ancient one, I'm drunk with the voice that comes out of your mouths. When they open like green bells, then implode and dissolve. My literary cruise of the Mediterranean brought me to many ports and lands. Each wave that carried me created new waves to surf, to rediscover the Mediterranean consciousness, and hear once more the ancient song of sirens. In this journey, I heard many voices with a myriad of accents and intonations. I encountered different cultures and beliefs. However, all of them had the same underlying message and cry for help. Give the Mediterranean another chance to reclaim, once again, the centrality it possessed in times past. All of the authors I studied believe that a new renaissance is possible and only a new Mediterranean humanism can be the solution to many social and political issues of today. A renaissance that might help to avoid falling victim to both religious and indeed economic fundamentalism. We have to relearn to be like the ancient Greeks who sat in front of the sea for hours to smoke their pipes, listening to the waves, watching the sunset, letting ourselves lulled by the silence of the sea. This is the Mediterranean religiousness, its true spiritual food. The Mediterranean as both a concept and a historical and cultural formation is a reality that it is imaginatively constructed. The political and poetical articulation of a shifting, desired object and a perpetual repressed realization. To talk of the, of the Mediterranean, of its past, present and future, is to move in a disquieting place. The Mediterranean is a continent with liquid, solid boundaries and nomadic inhabitants. This is the view of Bruno Etienne. 
Critical language travels along the cusp between the known and the unknown in transit between the familiar maps of a domestic interior and the hazy territories of the external world between our way of life and that which exceeds its comprehension. Uh, Silvia Ioannides, uh, a Greek poet, wrote that it is like this in the Mediterranean, a world that sinks its teeth into your flesh until there is nothing left, not even a white bone to be buried beneath the tumultuous herd. The Mediterranean is a sea of migrating cultures. The space of the Mediterranean, both as a sea and a combinatory territory, remains elusive, a perpetual question. The sea is not something to possess, rather it proposes a passage of wisdom. Was not Ulysses the first immigrant? Uh, al Karat, one of the sirens I've encountered, defines the Mediterranean as a disquieting sea that harbors an ambiguous, stratified, and invariable repressed unity, in which the colonial project framed and directed the brutal explanation of, the ex of an expansive and universalizing modernity. Quote, here in the stream languages of the sea, where the waves turn to flesh and continue to echo in long nights of memory, I'm brought to a home in which I don't yet know how to live." End quote. A few years ago, Franco Cassano wrote about the necessity of the southern thought and the need to reform the gaze people have cast on the Mediterranean. What he wrote years ago is true, if not even more real today. In the last century, he claims, the Mediterranean was associated with negative symbolism. It was, it was perceived as the anti-modern demon. The Mediterranean is the negative counterweight to Europe. While the latter pulls up upward, northward, the Mediterranean drags us down. Quote, to reform this gaze means to place the Mediterranean centrally, to think of it as a connection that without negating its ancient patterns, wants to differentiate itself from them in a basic way, becoming a connection that is capable of moving beyond the epoch of nation states that many call early or first modernity. Very few things are more powerful than gazes. Very few things naturalize and neutralize hierarchies more than they do. To start demanding their reform is therefore not a dream, even though in order to contemplate it, we must let the imagination fly forward, as happens more often and more easily to writers, musicians, and film directors." End of quote. So what needs to be done is to accept once again, as common, uh, as common in ancient times, that the, Mediterranean, that the Mediterranean is an irreducible pluriverse that does not allow itself to be reduced in a single verse. Its value rests precisely in this irreducible multiplicity of voices. Uh, the mental frontier, which especially these days builds walls, must be destroyed. The word frontier derives from the Latin fronts, frontis, front, forehead. Frontiers are places where countries and the human beings who inhabit them meet and confront each other. Being present before one another can mean many things. First of all, looking at, at, at the other, learning about him, confronting and understanding what we might expect from but the existence of the other can be insidious. The most restless frontiers are those that are not recognized. Only by destroying the frontier and dueling on the borderline, one can encounter the other who should not be seen as the ghost of ourself, but its projection knowing that the balance between departure and return was born on the Mediterranean. Many Mediterranean writers share with Ciaramelli the idea that to inhabit the border means then to be inclined to trespass, traveling across the border that separates the familiar from the foreign, jeopardizing identity. The South is necessary because, quote, after a long period of being demonized, nowadays the South is sought for the opposite reason because we have discovered that, even in the accounted obsessions of business, it is a decisive factor of production. In a world where everything seems to become liquid, the longing for the South is a longing for land, our sensual memory, the moments when we and the Earth pay homage to each other. Or it is the time where our work is not a divine punishment, but a happy landing for our flight." End of quote. 
So the southern revision of culture is not a dream, but something that is already happening in areas that are allowed greater freedom in cinema, music, literature, theater, and so on. The Mediterranean has always been and can still be the privileged location for dialogue and for building peace. It is the place where Western modernity must confront its other. As Raffaele Negro wrote, quote, since the late 70s, the feeling of the Mediterranean exploded in us as, the polit as a political utopia, as rebellion conception, nihilism, and indifferent as an alternative to the commitment of shattered social socialism because it was just a comforting thought that the Mediterranean was a sea route from the combining forces to cultural uniformity." End of quote. Uh, but today, the Mediterranean is a place of anxiety and contrast, as well as struggle, of misery, of questions. The deeper thought I caught in this long journey in the land of remorse is that the Mediterranean is a restless sea contaminated by disorder. Instead, the Mediterranean must be rediscovered and reinvented through its link with the present, seen no longer as an obstacle but as a resource. The Mediterranean can interrupt the fundamental monolinguism of the modern and the increasingly shallow and flattened language of the media and widen the, the, the reach of thought and experimentation. A new geophilosophy is therefore required if one wants to seize and preserve the irreducible faces of the spiritual, cultural, historical, and landscape of communities and places. Uh, the Mediterranean is the memory of another story. Experience is unique in the world. The encounter between sea and earth, sharing space that separates and divides. The Mediterranean is the space of confrontation, but also of congregation. From this sea of differences, Europe emerged. Could we all become once again Mediterraneans and find a new ancient equilibrium between heaven, heaven earth, and sea? Could this model of ancient sea become a universal configuration in a universal world? Can we all together open ourselves to the other, the stranger, the unfamiliar, and recognize in them their radical heterogeneity and their irreducible otherness? These are some of the questions that these authors uh, ask. So thinking about the Mediterranean, therefore, demands designing this space, not as a dull and obliterated region, but as, but as a dynamic, tangible interface that secures the connection and the setting of closely related territories. Paul Valéry defined it as a matrix space, a machine to make of civilization. We seem to have forgotten about that. So, um, and we should basically exploit the fact that the Mediterranean offers the advantage of cultural proximity, which has been enriched and developed through history. A Mediterranean way of life, therefore, is a nursery and not a crucible. The Mediterranean is Dionysus and can be seen as a matrix of the future. What needs to be done is to rethink a new Mediterranean space. Um, is, therefore, a new geophilosophy geo possible? Yes, provided that, for example, the role of women changes. Women in the diverse Mediterranean cultures have been the conveyors of important cultural assets transmitted through time, such as language, beliefs, oral literature, as well as ecological and artistic knowledge. Uh, moreover, over the last few decades, thanks to education and training, women have been able to invigorate the business, political, scientific, academic, and cultural world. But the status of women on the southern shores is evolving very slowly not only because of the mentality, but also due to the lack of resources or real political will. Another obstacle to a new geophilosophy comes from the differences between the north and the south of the Mediterranean. Most of the Arabic writers denounce the imbalance between the southern and northern shores of the Mediterranean. Their novels speak of immigration, religious and political conflicts, but also of the necessity for unity for the Mediterranean world. Only this unity can help to overcome the religious differences. They also insist, though, on the fact that the Mediterranean people need to discover each other, need to be thought through literature, for example, about the other. With Camus, 
we seek in the Mediterranean countries the, fount quote, the fountains of life where Europe, exhausted and ashamed, will one day go back to quench its thirst, end of quote. So by promoting a knowledge of the encounter in which linguistic, literary, and cultural traditions remain alive and circulate, comparative literature can begin to work, according to Nishi, Nishi as a discipline of decolonization. It can help non-Western cultures disenf disenfranchise themselves from the imperialism of Western thought. At the same time, it should foster a process of self-criticism and transformation of the Western intellectual tradition, leading, for instance, to Europe's decolonization from itself. Pavese, for example, another author, was aware, for example, that the genius is wisdom and youth. Quote, when a race no longer has a vital sense of its own past, it is dying out. Creative vitality springs from what has been stored in the past. We become creators when we have a past. The youth of a race is a, is a rich old age. End of quote. So it is time to interpret the Mediterranean space in its religious, cultural, historical context beyond the conflicts and political ruptures between the East-South and the West-North shores, so to avoid analysis that can be redundant cliché. I would favor instead a recovery of a project on the genealogy of values on a larger scale, more open to recent contributions of social sciences and more inclusive of the cultural and intellectual experiences developed in the Mediterranean. Um, is the Mediterranean culture's only focus to draw on idealistic speculation and nostalgic evocation? Is it possible, despite ongoing globalization, which overlooks the humanist need, to create a, a new, unified, creative imagination based on our rich history of thought and culture? I believe so, and I urge schools of all uh, types to do so. We need to go beyond the concept of ghettization of literature and encourage transnational teaching. Literature is dialogue, and through literature we should promote a dialogue of peoples. For example, Eri De Luca, whose writing focuses a lot on the Mediterranean issues, and who recently wrote a beautiful poem dedicated to Our Father's Sea, which for lack of time I will not read to you, said that the Mediterranean is, is the grafting of many peoples, the raising of submerged robes, and the birthplace of writing. Amongst the sirens I met, Malika Mokedem as one of the most distinctive voices. As she explains in an interview, Mokedem's departure from the Sahara of her earlier publication and selection of the Mediterranean Sea as the setting from Nzid, that's the name of the novel, sorry for my Arabic pronunciation, stems from personal and professional, professional motivations. Quote, intolerance and threats of violence motivated me to cross it the Mediterranean, one day. For better or for worse, I became a child of the North Shore as well. My confrontation with the other on the other shore revealed to me that I was both the same and different. It led to my discovery of my other, a universal quality whose initial seeds had been planted in me as early as my childhood by a tra traversing language." End of quote. Uh, her geographical displacement for the southern to the northern shore of the Mediterranean promotes the investigation of her own identity, I'm talking about a woman here, an Arab, through personal, linguistic, and cultural contact with the other. It builds upon traditional meanings of the Mediterranean, including, for example, a very important concept for her, which, is, which she calls métissage. So the mixing of different cultures, which is also interesting enough, not only her own a concept important for her, but also for a lot of North African women, such as Leila Sebar, Asia Djebar, and Mahissa Bey, who include reference to Western and non-Western texts in their <coughs> works. This particular book, which was published in 2013, which I repeat, it's Nzid, I apologize again for the pronunciation, in Arabic means the Mediterranean as a birthplace or as a place of rebirth and con or continuity. So that we could translate it as I am born 
but also I go on or, I, or keep going. And in this novel, beautiful novel, in which the sea is her mantra and so on, she essentially goes through uh, all the metissage, the different mixing of cultures, uh, traditions and culture by this, taking this journey, okay, from the south shore of the Mediterranean, get it into the north shore. So it's a, it's a beautiful um, example of, uh, of what it means to be Mediterranean these days. Another powerful epic song has been written by Hedi Burahi, a Tunisian uh, author who wrote a trilogy unknown by many in which he imagines a modern Ulysses, who, whom he calls Hannibal, traveling all around the Mediterranean. Quote, don't we all live in a precarious and dangerous place, and especially in my own time? Hence the impression of being boned, a living dead in the era of interplanetary satellites. In this journey, Hannibal rediscovers Mediterranean values, such as the affection between generations, the ability to communicate and to know how to integrate in a harmonious way, the gift of speech, oral traditions, openness to others, hospitality, and to highlight the similarities between the South Shore and the North Shore of the Mediterranean, the pride of the island, the permanent contact with the sea. Uh, the Mediterranean civilization in these books appears under the sign of seven virtues which I personally think should be revived. Humanism, love, truth, justice, tolerance, peace, respect. Um, Mediterranean unity seems possible, but prejudices about people of the South Bank often considered potential terrorists, smart and unreliable people, must be removed. I believe the literature is the best antidote, antidote to prejudice that exists. Uh, and Buari agrees with me when he says, quote, why are we spending much of our time denying the culture of origin? the amazigite, that's how he calls it, and the melting pot of the contribution of Arabs, Greeks, Roman, Phoenicians, in which we are blended for 23 centuries. Take Sicily, for example, one of the places where Hannibal visits. Is Sicily not the best example of multicultural art in which civilization overlap and add in their specific beauty to blend into a divine unity? We had the impression of being at the same time in a church, a mosque, and a synagogue without being able to distinguish the boundaries or borders. Nowadays, everybody spouts multiculturalism as, as the way forward, not realizing it is already there. Uh, according to Buari, the Mediterranean is a crossroads where all the promises from antiquity to the present day come to life. Furthermore, as a language teacher as well, I cannot help pointing out the linguistic unity that already exists uh, uh, in the Mediterranean. Reading a menu, for example, you notice that the names of the dishes in Italian are the same in the Tunisian dialect. O becomes U. Examples, broth in English, brodo, brudu, cod, baccala, baccalao. That's uh, already a sign of the, of the unity. Um, I'm going, I don't know. The themes developed in the writings of this Mediterranean author are essentially the same. Even though these writers come from different countries, one cannot, cannot help but be amazed at the fact that they all long for the same goals and share the same despair. Uh, their expectation for the Mediterranean is to have a greater role uh, in the future. Um, they also these writers wish to create an ongoing dialogue between all the peoples of the Mediterranean through the poetry, music, painting. They want to teach ways to avoid the risk of falling in the net of claustrophobia and the fear of facing each other. Um, another author, which I'm going to briefly mention because I have the time, talks about building a path around the Mediterranean, Oliver Goers whose beautiful little text, uh, not translated in English, that talks about uh, this, uh, these things. So in conclusion, a new Mediterranean philosophy animated by the genius Loci is required. According to Guardini, reemphasized by Veneziani, the great strength of Mediterranean thought lies in the unity between visible and invisible, interiority and exteriority, soul and body.
Nowadays, the Mediterranean is the sea of hope and tragedy, of intertwining of civilization and barbarism, uh, the hinge that joins and separates at the same time. But can we ever, ever imagine a mature Europe if it rejects the Mediterranean with its Greek roots, Roman, Christian, Arab, and Jewish influences, not to mention Turkish and Norman? Uh, European integration shall never be conceived as a pure adoption of the Nordic paradigm, technical and financial, that is, erasing the inevitable duality between the European Mediterranean civilization. Um, I believe it is imperative to implement from elementary to university level literature courses with strong emphasis on Mediterranean authors. Educators need to develop and create a narrative that could speak to future generations and teach them the values of diversity, multiculturalism, and so forth. Only literature can absolve this duty because its power lies in stimulating the imagination that shapes our emotional experience of the world. Literature can return to be an exemplum and therefore a moral guide that can help us to overcome what I believe are three evils of today's world. Emotional illiteracy, moral amnesia, and spiritual anemia. If we desire it, this mare can still be nostrum. Thank you, but let me finish with uh, Bontale. Quote again from Mediterranean. We don't know how it will turn out. Tomorrow, hard-pressed or happy, perhaps our path will lead to virgin clearings, where youth's water murmurs eternal, or maybe come down to the last valley in the dark, the memory of morning gone. Foreign lands may welcome us again. We'll lose the memory of the sun. The chime of rhymes will abandon their mind. the mind. Oh, the fable that explains our life will suddenly become the murky tale that can't be told. Antony and Cleopatra was probably written in 1607, only a couple of years or less after King Lear and Macbeth. Though all three plays are considered among, to be among Shakespeare's greatest achievements, Antony and Cleopatra, because of its highly individual quality, has frustrated critics who have tried to understand what kind of play it is. In the folio of 1623, the play is described and, as, and grouped with the other tragedies, but a number of distinguished <coughs> critics, including A.C. Bradley and G. Wilson Knight, consider Antony and Cleopatra as something other than a tragedy. It's been labeled, for example, a Roman play, a problem play, and even as a play belonging to no genre. One of the most remarkable features of Antony and Cleopatra, much commented on, is its massive scope. The world depicted in some of the earlier tragedies, notably Hamlet and Macbeth, can seem narrow and confining, confining enough to fit on an Elizabethan stage. Macbeth famous, famously feels cabin, cribbed, confined, while Hamlet considers Denmark a prison. The characters, the characters in both plays often feel shut in and cornered with nowhere to turn. Antony and Cleopatra, however, has the opposite effect. It seems almost too big for the stage, as if Shakespeare were trying to encompass the great globe itself in a single play. All the world's a stage, and the stage in this instance is virtually all the world. As Frank Kermode points out, the word world occurs some 45 times in the play. Thus, Antony and Cleopatra is noteworthy, not only because it portrays an important historical moment in the Mediterranean world, but also because it covered so much ground, literally and figuratively. As the action shifts from Rome to Alexandria and back again, over and over, we recognize that the drama not only attempts to tell a story about Antony and Cleopatra, but about Rome and Alexandria, west and east. In the play, Shakespeare divides the world into Rome and Egypt. Um, and there are a number of opposing binaries that are enumerated by G. Wilson Knight. Some of them include virtue and pleasure, empire and self-destruction, firmness and infirmity of purpose, solidity and instability, reason and passion, lucky winner and generous loser, the rising and the falling man, Caesar and Antony, Octavia and Cleopatra, end quote. 
Many of these binaries help us to understand Antony and his divided or double nature. This dividedness being pulled in two directions at once, east and west, is one of several reasons why Antony declines and falls. His decline or dissolution is evident from the very first line of the play. There, Antony's supposed dotage is alluded to, and Act 1, Scene 1 concludes with two Romans agreeing that the rumors about Antony, in other words, that he has become a strumpet's fool, are in fact true. Certainly, the play delineates Antony's decline and fall, but the reasons given or hinted at are not so easy to discern. In this respect, as Harbage points out, Shakespeare chose not to follow the view of his source, Plutarch, um, who asserted that, quote, the love of Cleopatra was the last and extremest mischief that befell Antony, end quote. Fortunately, Shakespeare does not blame the demise of Antony simply on his entanglement with a gypsy. It's more complicated. Antony's problem, in part, is his inability to reconcile or integrate the double life he leads. Though at times a Roman thought recalls Antony to a sense of his duties and responsibilities, he often cultivates forgetfulness, unburdening himself of his duties, cares, and Romanness. Very early in the play, Antony declares, quote, let Rome in Tiber melts and the wide arch of the ranged empire fall. Here is my space, end quote. Coming from one of the three triumvirs, the lines are at the very least ironic. They could even be construed as treasonous. In the very next scene, however, Antony says to himself, quote, these strong Egyptian fetters I must break or lose myself in dotage, end quote. Does Antony fear that he's losing himself because he's weakening or simply because he's changing? His schizophrenia or doubleness is reflected and to some extent occasioned by the seemingly endless scene shifts from Rome to Alexandria and back again. Just as the play lacks a stable center, unless it's the immovable Octavius, so too does Antony. In Rome, he's one man, in Alexandria, another. Whereas Octavius will simply conquer and appropriate Egypt for Rome, Antony himself has been appropriated by Egypt, a word that refers not only to a place, but to Cleopatra. In the play, Rome represents not only the center of the Western world, but the locus of masculine power and masculinity. The preeminent value for Roman men was virtus, which included the concepts of valor, courage, success in battle, and duty. That's what Antony means when he thinks of himself or refers to himself as a Roman. The East, however, is associated with luxury, licentiousness, and femininity. It is Antony who says, the beds in the East are soft, and in the East my pleasure lies. The East is also a place ruled by a woman, and it's very different ethos, undercuts, or at least challenges Antony's Roman ways and assumptions. Whereas Caesar is surrounded by men, mostly soldiers, Cleopatra's retinue consists primarily of female attendants and Mardian, a eunuch. If not Shakespeare, then at least the Roman characters in the play question and mock the effect that the East has on, had on Antony's manliness, his Roman, his Roman virtus. Antony is not only becoming soft, but from their point of view, womanish. Speaking to Lepidus, Caesar says, quote, from Alexandria, this is the news. Antony fishes, drinks, and wastes the lamp of night in revel. Is not more manlike than Cleopatra, nor the queen of Ptolemy more womanly than he, end quote. The Antony that once was, the Herculean Antony, is remembered and mourned throughout the play, even by Caesar. Caesar remembers a time when Antony, after a battle, had to survive for days by eating the roughest berry and the barks of trees and was even forced to eat strange flesh. Then was Antony a soldier. Now, however, he seems to be mostly a masker and a reveler, the words Cassius used to describe Antony and Julius Caesar. 
What's particularly galling to the Romans is Antony's apparent submissiveness to Cleopatra. It's one thing to sleep with her. Even Octavius admits that, quote, it is not amiss to tumble on the bed of Ptolemy. Uh, but to capitulate to her, to lose himself for her, is weak and therefore un-Roman. Antony has, according to Caesar, given his empire up to a whore. There are times in the play when Antony tends to agree with Caesar's judgment. He acknowledges to his men that he has lost command, but places much of the blame on Cleopatra because she should have known he couldn't resist following her lead. Quote, you did know how much you were my conqueror and that my sword made weak by my affection would obey it on all cause, end quote. You know, Barbus, who believes that war is man's work, tells Cleopatra that, quote, to set in Rome that Phonius, a eunuch, and your maids manage this war, end quote. Antony seems to confirm this when he says, believing that Cleopatra has betrayed him to Caesar, quote, she has robbed me of my sword. One needn't be a Freudian to conclude that the words have a secondary meaning. Antony's line also recalls Othello's well-known valedictory to glorious war. Farewell, he said, Othello, Othello's occupation gone. In Shakespeare, at least, war and women do not mix. Antony's other problem in this play, as opposed to Julius Caesar, is that in this play, as opposed to Julius Caesar, he must contend against two personalities stronger than his own, one Roman, one Egyptian. And Julius Caesar, Nobody, once Caesar was killed, was obviously stronger or more resolute than he. Um, Antony and Octavius worked together and finally agreed to rule together while Brutus was dead by the end of the play. It's now 13 years later, and Mark Antony is 50 years old, perhaps not quite an old man even by Roman standards, but fast approaching the seer and yellow leaf stage. Antony mocks Octavius because he's so young and leaves the fighting to his soldiers. But for reasons not entirely knowable, Antony can never seem to outmatch him. When in Rome, Antony asked a soothsayer the following, quote, whose fortune shall rise higher, Caesar's or mine? The soothsayer answers, thy demon, that thy spirit which keeps thee, is noble, courageous, high, unmatchable, where Caesar is not. But near him thy angel becomes afeard as being overpowered. Therefore, make space enough between you." End quote. The battle between Antony and Octavius occurs for many reasons. The generational conflict is part of it. What's unusual is that it's Antony, the older man, who comes across as the hot-headed one with unreliable judgment. For example, it's Antony who resorts to name-calling referring to Octavius as a mere boy, and who against all precedent challenges Octavius to single combat. Octavius, meanwhile, remains calm and inexorable. He seems to be fighting for Rome and empire, while Antony seems to be driven by personal and sentimental reasons. But the Roman view of the causes of Antony's destruction, which center around his alliance with Cleopatra and his betrayal of Roman values, is an explanation that Shakespeare refuses to endorse absolutely. He seems intent, rather, upon giving Alexandria equal time with Rome. For example, though both Antony and Cleopatra received top billing, at least in the title, it is, most critics agree, Cleopatra's play. As she Bradley asserted about 100 years ago, uh, that Cleopatra is one of Shakespeare's four inexhaustible characters. The other three, according to Bradley, are Hamlet, Falstaff, and Iago. Thus, the most charisma charismatic, memorable character in the thus the most charismatic, memorable character in the play is synonymous with Egypt, um, as Cleopatra is often called. Nor is Antony the only Roman who, upon encountering Cleopatra, made his will lord of his reason. Including Antony, Cleopatra, uh, including. Antony, she has been mistress of her own triumvir. Julius Caesar and Pompey were her lovers before Antony. Cleopatra then is accustomed to being both conqueror and conquered. 
Perhaps it is just that, her ability to play both roles simultaneously, that helps to explain her enigmatic appeal. Those who attempt to capture her are themselves captured in a strong toil of grace. This is not surprising in a woman who descended from Ptolemy, one of Alexander the Great's generals. But what is it about Cleopatra that makes her irresistible to Roman conquerors, with a notable exception of Octavius? Or is she not so much irresistible as convenient, ready to hand for Romans, ready to enjoy the spoils of war? A close reading of the play, as well as a critical response to the play, tends to endorse Eno Barbus's famous tribute to her. Of Cleopatra, he says, quote, age cannot wither her, nor custom stale her infinite variety. Other women cloy the appetites they feed, but she makes hungry where most she satisfies, end quote. It might also be true that Cleopatra is a contrast gainer, a woman set apart not only by her beauty, but also by her foreignness and by everything that makes her different. At its most basic, Cleopatra is not Antony's Roman wife or wives. Presumably, both Fulvia and Octavia, Octavia pale in comparison to the dark-browed dark gypsy. The irony is that Cleopatra, a lusty and capricious queen, is what, a, is what Roman men would not allow Roman women to be. When Antony marries Octavia, Octavius' sister, she is described as a woman of a holy, cold, and still conversation. Upon hearing this, one Roman wonders, who would not have his wife so? You know, Barbus replies, not Antony. It's no wonder that Antony returns to his Egyptian dish. Octavia, Octavia may not be to Antony's taste, but she is to Octavius, her brother. He's been described by a critic as a chilly personality, very temperate, very efficient, and cunning. Perhaps it's the high-flown passion of Antony and Cleopatra that we remember, but it's Roman efficiency and intelligence that win the day, uh, that in fact win the age. For as Caesar announces, the time of universal peace is near. Like Aeneas before him, at least as he's portrayed in Virgil's epic, Octavius puts duty, or virtus, before everything else, and so becomes the world's landlord. The one specific allusion to Aeneas and Dido <coughs> is made by Antony after he's been told falsely that Cleopatra is dead. Imagining himself and Cleopatra in the other world, in the underworld, or better yet, the Elysian fields, Antony says, quote, where souls do couch on flowers, will hand in hand, and with our sprightly port make the ghost gaze. Dido and her Aeneas shall want troops, and all the haunt be ours." End quote. Perhaps it's natural that Antony should dream of spending eternity with Cleopatra, but it's indicative of his vanity and concern for the world's opinion that he imagines them as the ultimate power couple or brightest Hollywood stars in the next world. Besides, uh, as Barbara Everett argues, Octavius is the true Aeneas. Antony is the Aeneas who stayed with Dido. Perhaps Antony has more in common with Dido than with Aeneas. Like her, as well as Cleopatra, Antony kills himself. It's been called a good death, which mattered a great deal to a Roman soldier, but I would argue that here again he's upstaged by Cleopatra. Antony is so angry by the loss of the battle and Cleopatra's supposed betrayal that she hides herself away and has her servant report that she has killed herself, her last words supposedly being, most noble Antony. Antony is, sh is ashamed that while she has acted so nobly, he lacks even, quote, the courage of a woman. Determining to join Cleopatra in death, he wounds himself but does it ineptly as he says, I have done my work ill, friends. Not only does Antony strike himself prematurely, like Cassius and Julius Caesar, but botches the job in the process. Further, he seems unaware that he looks rather weak and ineffective. Instead, he proclaims that he, a Roman, has, quote, by a Roman been val valiantly vanquished. Meanwhile, since Antony has been carried into the monument to spend his dying minutes with Cleopatra, 
He's having a hard time getting a word in since Cleopatra, the drama queen, is holding court surrounded by her vassals. On the verge of death, Antony says, quote, I am dying, Egypt, dying. Give me some wine and let me speak a little, end quote. Generally, the words of a dying man are accorded great respect, weighted as they are with the touch of the next world. But in this case, Cleopatra replies, no, let me speak. Her response is both funny and a put down of Antony. Cleopatra asserts, consciously or not, that even at such a moment, he is less important than she is. It could be argued that Shakespeare himself gives credence to such a judgment. Antony dies at the end of Act Four, well before a tragic or historical hero typically finds death. With the stage cleared of Antony, Act Five belongs solely to Cleopatra. At the end of Act Four, Cleopatra prepares herself and us for her death. She says that after burying Antony, they will do, quote, what's brave, what's noble, after the high Roman fashion, and make death proud to take us, end quote. Here, Cleopatra's, uh, here Cleopatra's, Cleopatra's yet, yet again one-ups Antony, who didn't entirely or live or die by the high Roman fashion. If she didn't learn what that fashion was from Antony, Perhaps she learned it from the stories he told of the Battle of Philippi, where both Cassius and Brutus, the noblest Roman of them all, killed themselves rather than suffer the humiliation of being captured and led in triumph through the streets of Rome. Unless she kills herself, that will be Cleopatra's fate as well, as Dolabella assures her. Cleopatra steals herself to this task in a manner reminiscent of Lady Macbeth. Cleopatra says, quote, my resolution's placed, and I have nothing of woman in me. Now, from head to foot, I am marble constant, end quote. Here again, we see the blending of those binaries, male, female, and Rome, Egypt, in this instance, characteristic of Antony and Cleopatra, characters who have been formed by both cultures. But those characters who are thoroughly Roman, such as Octavius, know only the straight Roman way. The high Roman fashion consists apparently of falling on one sword, a la Cassius, Brutus, Eros, a friend of Antony's, and Antony himself. Cleopatra may die in the high Roman fashion, but the means she uses, the pretty worm of Nihilus, are entirely local. Also, Cleopatra herself is identified with the Nile worm or serpent. It is one of Antony's pet names for her. So her use of it her use of it here draws attention to her act of self-murder. It might also suggest something about her serpentine character. The main work of Act Five is Cleopatra's suicide. Shakespeare lingers over it and takes pains to present her as a strong, remarkable woman. Harold Bloom argues, quote, no one else in Shakespeare makes so fine an end in a personal ritual of exaltation, end quote. Though Cleopatra expresses joy in depriving Octavius of his prize, she directs most of her final words to her husband and her coming transcendence. She says, quote, give me my robe, put on my crown. I have immortal longings in me. Husband, I come. Now to that name, my courage prove my title. I am fire and air. My other elements I give to baser life, end quote. Done with baser life, the royal Cleopatra rises to the challenge of the high Roman fashion and makes it her own. The Italian peninsula was the trade and financial center, uh, as well as the beacon of the Mediterranean culture, art and literature from the Middle Ages through the Renaissance. Um, talking about the Renaissance, I've just made a note taking inspiration from what you, you mentioned, Shakespeare. I wanted to leave Willie out of my, my paper, but certainly Antony and Cleopatra is closely related to the Mediterranean, but my note is on the Tempest. In fact, I did not develop this. But in the Tempest, there is one of the characters is Alonso, king of Naples. And uh, without going into the story, he's the father of Ferdinando, and it's one of those st stories which t uh, shows that Italy and uh, Spain in particular were considered by the English at the time as exotic countries 
far from everywhere and where betrayal, treason, poisoning, murder, this, is, this was the picture that they had of, the, of, the, of this country. And we're talking about The Tempest, which was like uh, Shakespeare's last, very last play, which was written in 1610, 1611. From there we go on was, and the, then the reform first, and the Enlightenment uh, in the 18th century brought a shift towards Northern Europe, namely London, Paris, and Amsterdam. But in Victorian and Edwardian Britain, thanks to the technological innovations, a traveling craze towards the Mediterranean, and especially Italy, helped the upper class uh, to search for culture, health, pleasure, artistic and spiritual inspiration. I will argue that, the, that travel, writing, and setting stories in exotic places like Italy became a reaction against the values of contemporary life. By way of example, in, in the 1840s, John Arthur Strat, a London painter and uh, writer, although he's known mainly as a painter, ventured all the way down to Sicily and came across the, on crossing Calabria, he came across the Arbresh. The Arbresh are, is the, fir the very first wave of Albanians to this country. I'm talking about six centuries ago. This, there were seven waves until the 18th century, the seven waves of, uh, of Albanian migrants. Uh, then comes Lawrence. I did not want to mention Lawrence, as you know. I mean, Lawrence is... Our yeah, yeah, and Lawrence has been... Uh, he's always here, and it's like a little monkey. I know that Lawrence would not like me saying that. Uh, but uh, uh, Lawrence identified uh, the South and its sun as the way to regain the primeval, uh, primeval link, human and, and the primeval nature. And uh, it was able to link human beings with nature and human beings also among themselves. This idea is exemplified in some of Lord, Lord Byron's poetry. And Byron, as we know, even gave his life at the end. He died there. He died. He fought for the independence of, uh, of Greece. Then there is the enforcers, the enforcers' stories. And uh, perhaps the one, uh, besides Lawrence, who was the one English uh, writer who was really committed to to, is it, to the south of Italy and the south in general and the Mediterranean is Norman Douglas, who spent most, uh, much of his life immersed in the Mediterranean. Um, there's just one more writer I'd like to uh, mention, is Lawrence Darrell, who after living in Corfu, Corfu Rhodes uh, in Cyprus, turned to Sicily, though as late as 1977. All that, in other words, is, um, is best expressed by the forerunner of a number of literary critics of the, the, of the 1980s and 90s, Paul Fassol, who declares that, quote, to sketch the history of the British imaginative intercourse with the Mediterranean in modern times is virtually to present a survey of modern British literature, unquote. In the past few decades, in fact, a number of critical studies have been entirely or partly devoted to an analysis of the role played by the Mediterranean in British literature and culture during the 19th and 20th centuries. One of the most interesting studies that approach the sea as a key topic in English literature is The Sea and Englishness in the Middle Ages, which was published in 2011. Sebastian Sobeski, the author of this book, in this fascinating work, quote, signified in their accounts of journeys through the South a hostility towards the values of the modern world and a desire to withdraw from its problems and complexities. Their works proclaim the sadness and the anger of men who were at odds with contemporary life and who were looking not for action but for, uh, but for rest, unquote. Um, at this point, Let's venture into analyzing bits and pieces of works of some of the writers I've just mentioned. And I'd like to take into consideration uh, those that were particularly lured by the Mediterranean uh, in, the f in the first few decades of the 20th century. Starting from Norman Douglas. Douglas, uh, 
died in 1952, so he spent most of his life in, 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 in Italy, but he traveled all over the, 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 the Mediterranean. When he developed a real vogue, of, a real vogue, a real craze for the South, and following a tradition of British, French artists, he accepted the challenge to travel to the toe of Italy in 1907, but went back a few other times there, and in 1915 came out with his most fascinating, one of the most fascinating travel books, entitled Old Calabria, where, if, my, if I may cite myself, as I pointed out in, the in a previous essay of mine, which was published in Etude de Laurentienne, he, quote, like many intellectuals, was well aware of the profound crisis in the values of Western civilization, identified with the hegemony of the English moralistic middle class, which he thought that could be fought by an unlikely return to a pagan world merged into a Mediterranean golden dream, unquote. By way of comment to, to this quotation, I must say that in that context, Douglas, without considering any historic perspective, experienced a highly involving discovery of the Mediterranean, yet not as an intellectual like Aldous Huxley, which is, who is one of the other uh, writers who, who who fell in love with the Mediterranean. Anyway, so not un un unlike oh, Huxley or Edith Louis Sitwell, since unlike them, he was far too conscious of his own sensuous fullness, fullness and his Mediterraneanness, which seems to be a term either coined by him or is one of the first one to, ones to use it. Uh, this, uh, with this term, he had acquired in a, uh, this Mediterraneanness is something that he acquired in a, in, a, in a lifetime. That is confirmed by the English critic uh, Richard, uh, Richard Holdington, who says, quote, once I asked Norman Point Black how long he had been writing Old Calabria, and in that knock and flat, crisp manner of his, he snapped 30 years, unquote. Talking about Douglas naturally leads to touching on his interest in Greek civilization, together with his passion for traveling, which made him wander all over the world and the Mediterranean area in particular. He interrupted his frenetic activity only with his stays in with his brief, some brief stays in England. His biographer, R Richard uh, McGillivray, considered his friend Norman as, quote, the man who who of all others in the present world of letters stand nearest to the ancient Greek point of view, unquote. Another one of his friends, Joseph Conrad, encouraged uh, Douglas to write Old Calabria and suggested he should fictionalize his impressions of, of uh, also of Messina in Sicily, which resulted in passages like the following, quote, mission in Africa cannot resist the temptation of visiting the enthralling place he would soon find out that the sparkling island on the Mediterranean makes him undergo a surprising metamorphosis, which made him feel younger once more, capable of fun and mischief." Unquote. Of course, that could not lead, in, lead Douglas, uh, but, uh, but away from the principles of the Anglican Church. In fact, in this respect, a conversation between uh, Douglas and an important local personage Count Caloveglia is quite telling, quote. I was much interested, Count, in what you said yesterday. You spoke of the Mediterranean becoming once more the center of human activity. There is an attraction in the, in the idea to one who, like myself, has been brought up on the classics and has never forgotten his spiritual debt to antiquity. But I question whether the majority of my countrymen would be moved by such considerations, unquote. In the course of their conversation, the Count expresses his hope that the Mediterranean people may take a leading role, which unfortunately has not come to true up to these days. On the contrary, today's sad or rather tragic events show that his was just a dream. Quote, in the Mediterranean, Mr. Heard, lies the hope of the humanity, and Mediterranean people will lead the way. They have suffered more than all from the imbecilities of kings and priests and soldiers and politicians. They now make an end of this uh, neurasthenic gadding and getting. That ancient individualistic tone reasser reasserts itself. Man becomes a personality once more." Unquote. Another great admirer 
of the Mediterranean, of the Mediterranean world, is uh, David Herbert Lawrence. Um, Lawrence, as you know, lived uh, a very short life, he, but he died when he was 45 in 1928. So we are talking about a writer who spent quite a number of years in Italy, all over Italy, going from Lake Garda in the north all the way down south to, to Sicily. The best way to stress Lawrence's attraction for, for the Mediterranean is what the, the novelist and critic Anthony Burgess, the author of, uh, as you know, of, uh, uh, Clockwork Orange, uh, who was really uh, an expert, less if I may call him so, in, in Lawrence's, in Lawrence. Anyway, Burgess said that Italy was Lawrence's true home. The Mediterranean is only sea. The gods of vine and olive, the only ones that did not let him down, unquote. After treading on the Italian soil in 1912 for the first time, Lawrence produced his very first travel book, Twilight in Italy, which was published in 1916. It's a melancholic and somber book, whereas his second, Sea in Sardinia, uh, resulting from a trip to Taormina, no, I mean from Taormina, where he and his wife were living at the time, to, uh, they traveled from Taormina to Palermo, Palermo, Cagliari, and back to Sicily. Um, to, I mean to, to Sicily, that's correct. This particular book, filled with a shining, colorful description of the Mediterranean, and gives, offers really a, a, beautiful, a beautiful image of Italy, full of, full of sand, full of life, full of uh, what Lawrence badly seems to, to be needing at the time. Uh, so Lawrence, like Douglas, had in mind this classical idea of that, of that area. Quote, lovely, lovely Sicily, the dawn the dawn place, Europe's dawn, with Odysseus pushing his ship out of the shadows into the blue. Whatever had died for me, Sicily had then not died. Dawn lovely Sicily and the Ionian Sea. We came back and the world was lovely. Our own house above the Olmon trees, the house was in Taormina, uh, and the sea in the cove below. Calabria, glimmering like a changing opal away to the left, across the blue bright straits and all the great blueness of lovely Don Sea in front, where the sun rose with a splendor like trumpets every morning, and me rejoicing like a madness in, in this dawn, day dawn, life dawn, the dawn which is Greece, which is me." Unquote. However, I'm afraid that uh, Lawrence could, as usual, find no peace anywhere he went, and soon became tired. Quote, became tired of this maddening, exasperating, impossible Sicilians who never knew what truth was and have lost all notion of what a human being is, as a, a sort of sulfurous demon. Andiamo, he says, andiamo. He says, andiamo to his wife, Frida von Richthofen, and off they went. And they went to Sardinia, back to Sicily, and then off to, to Ceylon, can you imagine? 1915, 1920 to be honest. Then Australia, back to Italy. The contradiction that emerges from such quotations is inherent in Lawrence's nature. But he has already made up his mind, he had already made up his mind and decided to continue his search in Sardinia, which would be another failure. There is no place that has not been blighted by man and industrialization. That was the problem. He could find no peace because he could find no place which had not been blighted by, the, by industrialization. The problem is, as he says in Nuoro, uh, uh, I think that uh, all of you, most of you know that Nuoro is at, uh, one of the towns in, in Sardinia. Even in such a remote Mediterranean island as Sardinia cannot meet his expectations. And he says, what? Wherever one is in Italy, either one is conscious of the present or of the medieval influences or of the far mysterious gods of the early Mediterranean. Man has lived here and brought forth his consciousness given in its expression and really finished it." Unquote. 
Though Lawrence and Douglas had two different approaches towards traveling, both of them were certainly attracted by the South. This self-evident that while Lawrence was back to Sardinia, to have been back to, to, to Sicily, he felt, as I already anticipated, that he had to go away from there too. Our last writer is Lawrence Darrell. Last and, uh, writer is Lawrence Darrell, the last one I've taken into consideration, who although spent much of his life beside the Mediterranean, unlike his colleagues, he wrote relatively little about Italy. It was quite late in Darrell's career that he wrote Sicilian Carousel, which was published as late as 19, 1977, a travel book based around a slightly fictionalized bus tour of uh, the biggest Mediterranean island, which was naturally bound to come for the Islamaniac Darrell. Having first immersed himself in the Greek islands of Rhodes, Corfu, and Cyprus, Lawrence Darrell turns to Sicily, uh, with his long and varied history and his spectacular archaeological remains. To equip himself for this formidable task, Darrell joined the tour, the Sicilian Carousel, and the account of his travels with a mixed bag of companions is characteristically sharp and witty. But the deeper theme is, Mediterranean, is the Mediterranean civilization, its manifestations and its meanings, not only in Sicily, but also in Greece, Italy, and southern France. Sicilian Car Carousel includes several poems by Darrell, not previously published, all inspired by different parts of the island, and this is illustrated by a selection of elegant engravings. Even if most critics agree that the life of each traveler is more interesting than uh, that the book itself, I must say that Darrell makes some subtle observations, as when he draws a line between the features characterizing the various Mediterranean countries and those which differentiate them. However, he remarks that there is no doubt that the Mediterraneanist exists. Quote, what was the Mediterranean tapestry all about anyway? Particularly when it came to extending the frame of reference in, in the direction of art, architecture, and literature, Italy, Spain, Greece, and the Midi of France, they all had the same light and the same garden produce. But why wasn't Spain Italy? Why wasn't Italy Greece or Greece Turkey? Different attitudes to religion, to love, to the family, to death, to life. Yes, deep differences, yet such striking likeness as to allow us to think of such a thing as a Mediterranean character. After all, there are many varieties of the olive tree, which for me will always mark the spiritual and physical boundaries of the magical and non-existent land, the Mediterranean. Martin was right. Martin is one of the characters there. How oh, I regret it not having come here before. Be that as it may, Unquote. The best part of the book is the last chapter, with Darrell alone for a week in Taormina, which is also the title of the chapter itself. Here is what he says to express how much he likes the overall atmosphere of, uh, in, the, in the little town. Taormina, the old bull mountain. I am so glad I followed my instinct and saved it up for the last. But tonight, I was in a mood to be alone, to enjoy and to regret being alone. Here one could sit in a deck chair, gazing out into the night and thinking about Greek flair and Roman prescience. They married here in this place. But why was it a failure at last? Why did it fall apart? Unquote. I'm sure it will be in interesting to hear that Darrell himself answers this question in the next sentence. Quote, because everything does, I suppose, is doomed to the same decline and fall. Unquote. I find that Darrell's words are extraordinarily foretelling of the fall of the British Empire, starting from the loss of the Suez War, let alone the Roman Empire. Then, on a more personal basis, he describes the enchanted atmosphere in Taormina, swarming with tourists in the main street, and makes also reference to Lawrence's stay there. Quote, its narrowness grew on one after the sixth of the seven or seventh turn upon it. And in the little side streets, there were unforgotten corners of the real Italy, by which I mean the peasant Italy with its firmly anchored values and purity of heart. At dusk, 
next day, I, w I walked up to have a look at the villa Lawrence occupied for three years. It was modest and quite fit into the poems he wrote here in his pure high tower of silence, which is Taormina at night, unquote. Then he says that, then Darrell says that by accepting the invitation of an English gentleman, a, a certain loftus, he would be found, he would find himself in an atmosphere recalling that of Capri. Now Capri was the place that Lawrence hated it and escaped from it. Stayed there just for a few, uh, a, short, a few days. Uh, Douglas loved it, and he wanted to die there, live there, and die there, and indeed. And uh, it's interesting here. Well, it's very short, but I'm not going on. It's just a short bit where Darrell, after so many years, links the two of them, links the presence, talks about the presence of the two writers who had been living in Capri and knew the Mediterranean very well, and, and offers, it's like, you know, a circle which finds, goes back to where it had started. It's the end of, uh, of the circle, and it's the end of this short presentation. Thank you.